Hey Gata members, what's going on? We are now just two weeks away from Gata Spring Management Conference in Indianapolis. Today's SMC update is sponsored by Air Products. Air Products is proud to announce Victoria Brifo, Senior Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer at Air Products as the industry speaker at this year's SMC. The second quarter issue of Welding and Gases today is online now and will be on site in Indianapolis. This issue features the SMC preview, the full schedule, and a full list of fun sites and attractions to explore while you visit the city. The second quarter issue also features a roundtable from five past GATA presidents discussing how you can make the most out of your time at a GATA national meeting. Thank you to 2015 GATA president Bill Vicentainer, 2011 president Brian Keane, 2010 president Lloyd Robinson, 2003 President Wally Brandt, and 1999 President Dave Mahoney for your help and insight in putting this article together. The entire article is full of great insights, so click the link in the description below to see all of the tips to get the most bang for your buck at this year's SMC. One of the biggest tips that each President offered to have a successful SMC is to do your homework before you arrive. One of the best ways to do that is through the SMC website. Once you've registered, you can log into the SMC website to see a full list of attendees. Scan the list and make a note of who you'd like to speak with or see at the show. The current list of attendees is over 600 people. You can also download the 2022 SMC app for a full list of events and attendees. The app also allows you to direct message attendees, set meetings, and post pictures and updates. It's an indispensable tool in the run-up to SMC and throughout the show. To download the app, search for Crowd Compass in the App or Google Play Store. Then, once you're inside the Crowd Compass app, search GATA. Another great source of information and networking opportunities is at the Contact Booth Program. This year's Contact Booth Program will take place on Monday, April 4th. Already, more than 120 booths have been sold. To see a full list of exhibitors and booth numbers, log in through the SMC site. Finally, GATA Media will be sending out daily SMC connections recapping each day's event and previewing the schedule for the following day. One last note, don't forget to bring your favorite team's jersey for the opening tailgate at the NCAA Hall of Champions and start stretching and warming up your arms for some of the fun athletic competitions that will take place during the event. We're already practicing for the event, so make sure to bring your A-games. We can't wait to see you at this year's Spring Management Conference. For more information about this year's SMC or to register, click the link in the description below. We've got a great episode lined up for you, so don't start those St. Patrick's Day festivities just yet, and stick around right after a word for today's presenting sponsor, Datacore. The packaged gas and welding supply industry needs a comprehensive software tool to track assets and effectively manage price volatility, procurement challenges, and new regulatory requirements. Datacore ERP does all of this and more. Our software helps gas distributors refine shipping and inventory processes, improve production and distribution models, track assets, and achieve long and short range planning with greater accuracy. Start using data to grow your business, enhance your productivity, and enable success with Datacore. Joining us first today is Brianna Applegate. She is the gas sales manager for General Air. Brianna, thank you for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Good to talk to you. Brianna, St. Patrick's Day is this week. It's one of the biggest bar and restaurant holidays of the entire year. Do you have to do anything differently in the run-up to that day to ensure that your clients are well stocked with beverage CO2? Definitely. So we do have a uh, like a predictive routing program that we use for all of our bulk CO2 customers, um, which is an algorithm that helps to predict when they're going to need their next CO2 fill. So we're fairly confident that they're going to have the product on hand as far as CO2 that they need um, when the big day comes. Uh, and our customers are, are pretty good about preparing for that as well and, and checking their gauges and things. Um, but of course, we always have our our hotshot team on call during that day. It's a it's a big day for troubleshooting and you know helping those systems that sometimes can't keep up. Um, and then all of our our micro bulk beverage customers have a backup switchover that can switch quickly to a fifty pound CO two cylinder, which is really helpful. Uh, gives buys us some time if there's any issues. Um, they can keep pouring that beer in the meantime. Uh, but what we've noticed the the, the Thing we really have to watch out for our customers that have nitrogen generators. So nitrogen is, you know, helps push the beer to the tap without over carbonating the beer. Um, and those nitrogen generators work great every other day of 
of the year, uh, but they really become overcome uh, when you're pouring, you know, beer after beer, pint after pint. So some of our larger customers, we have one uh, who does an event called Kegs and Eggs every year. And people line up downtown, 6 a.m., 5 a.m. in the morning, and it's uh, live music all day, and they're literally turning kegs every 20 minutes. Uh, so what we do for a customer like that is we stock them up with additional high-pressure nitrogen cylinders to help boost and support that nitrogen generator so they can just keep pouring those beers. <laughs> General Air talks on its website about beer waste reduction capabilities. Can you explain how the company helps its customers achieve optimal head on pours to ensure waste reduction? The most important and the best way we can help with that is through education. Um, all of our account managers are equipped with the knowledge and, and the power to help our draft customers understand, uh, you know, back to that nitrogen balance uh, topic, you know, it's you, you need the CO2, of course, to keep the, the carbonation as the brewer intended, but then you need that nitrogen to push it to the tap and get that flow you need. And the balance between the two, the mix of that CO2 and nitrogen is so important and every system is slightly different. So we just really have um, try and educate our customers. We do a seminar periodically called the Perfect Pour where we go through gas mixes and beer line cleaning and all those different things that go into maintaining that perfect head and why, you know, that's so much more efficient. Not only are you getting the most beer out of the keg in the proper way, um, but you're giving that customer that experience with the, with that proper head and the proper foam. So you're getting the whole aromatic experience and everything while being able to sell every pint in that keg. So COVID had a huge impact on the bar and restaurant industry. Can you discuss the impact on the beverage carbonation industry? And now that we're starting to move past COVID, have you seen a return to pre-pandemic levels? It was interesting that, um, you know, of course, many, many bars and restaurants had to close their doors. You know, their, their main business was, was walk-in. Um, and when we were all forced to stay home and everyone was forced to keep their doors closed, a lot of people didn't have the, the infrastructure to provide the takeout and the, and the things that really, you know, brought in the margins for them. So we did see we did see many close their doors. Of course, fast food, though, um, was heavy and uh, everyone was going through those drive throughs So we sold, you know, quite a bit to the to the fast food industry. Um, but what's encouraging to see is. Many of the restaurants that have had to close their doors, we're seeing new ownership come and take over and reopen within the past year, which is really exciting to see. Um, and in Denver, we're in a big growth market. There's a lot of new construction happening, which is really cool. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things, uh, Colorado and Denver, are we're a big beer state. We, we do a lot of microbrews out here. We love our beer. And what was neat to see was a lot of our small to moderate microbreweries um, turned to packaged product versus just selling pints, you know, in the tap room. Um, so we've seen a lot more canning and bottling and, and things like that. And uh, they're opening, oh gosh, with the, even within the last six, eight months or so, we've seen quite a few of these breweries open production facilities specifically meant for packaged beer. And we're able to put large bulk receivers and um, some of the, the bigger CO2 tanks there to support those efforts, which, which is really exciting to see. And then of course we can see the product on the grocery store our shelf now, which is really cool. <laughs> Last year, there were widespread reports of a CO2 shortage. How did you deal with the shortage at General Air? It, it was really interesting. You know, of course, many, many of CO2 suppliers around the country are, are sourcing their product from ethanol plants. Um, that's one of the main sources. And it, it was really interesting that cause and effect that COVID had on that industry you know, when everyone was staying home, the, the demand for ethanol was virtually non-existent. So if there's no demand, they're not going to produce it, which means there's no CO2 to capture. And that's what a lot of us were experiencing. Um, just kind of the things you don't think about that are connected until it, you know, something catastrophic happens. Um, so yeah, our General Air's main supply source is an ethanol plant right here in Colorado uh, that was shut down for quite some time. But we are luckily lucky in that we're in a market that's unique, and our supplier also has alternate sources from a plant that's uh, 
that produces anhydrous ammonia, so which is an industrial fertilizer. So they were still producing. We could get some CO2 from them. And then they also have a, a natural mine source in a state nearby where they could truck it in by rail car. So we were really fortunate in that uh, all of our contracted customers and all of our high volume customers, we were able to supply them with the CO2 they needed. Sure, it came at a little bit higher cost because of the additional transportation and everything, um, but they were able to get what they needed. And I think that with the balance of the customers who weren't able to use CO2 because their doors were closed kind of helped relieve some of the pressure as well. Is there anything else about St. Patrick's Day or the state of the beverage industry that you want to discuss before we go today? I mean, St. Patrick's Day, we recognize it's a huge day for draft sales. Um, we're all beer drinkers too, and we want to make sure everybody enjoys their day. So, you know, the biggest thing that we can do is just be available to our customers on that day. We've all got our, our cell phones at the ready and... Um, just if anybody needs anything, our technicians are on hand and we just pick up every phone call we can and, and make sure that everyone has what they need for that day. Um, and just, you know, as far as COVID and state in general, like I said, it's, it's encouraging to see the rebound um, in, in both our, our draft customer base. But like I mentioned, the fast food industry is holding strong, which is really great. Um, and that just that our breweries have really thrived during this time. Brenna, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. We're joined next today by Laura Brumsey. Laura is the Vice President of Operations and Administration for the CGA. Laura, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here and I'm excited to talk with you today. As cannabis has become legalized in more and more states and has become a real growth industry, can you discuss some of the most common questions the CGA has received from its members? So as cannabis has become legalized in several states and it's grown from a cottage industry into a more formalized kind of sector of industrial production and aggregation. The first question that a lot of our members had for us were, how are our products and equipment being used in these facilities? So we reached out, we have a couple of, of colleagues who have done more work in this space than we had at the time. Uh, we touched base with NFPA with some of our members who are already actively engaged in these spaces to learn more about what was actually happening with the gases that were being used. Once we had that information, we went back to our members and helped them understand that for the ones who hadn't gotten engaged in this space yet. And the biggest question that they had at that time was how can we help educate the cannabis operators in this new field about the potential hazards of the gases and equipment that they're working with? Because, you know, like with any industry like this, there's a lot of turnover. And they really just were concerned about making sure that the employees in these facilities could safely use the products and equipment that they were working with. The other area where we got some questions was, is there any concerns about the equipment coming back to us from these facilities? Is there a concern that the cylinders could be contaminated by the oil residues and things like that that are produced in the extraction processes? So we did some work on that with our committees. We, again, talked to people with practical experience in the field, and we did find that, yes, in some cases, that was an issue. So to respond to that, we published a CGA position statement, and that's PS64, and it's a position statement on handling carbon dioxide cylinders previously used in cannabis extraction or with food products containing cannabis, and it gives people some guidance on what to do with the cylinders that are coming back from these facilities. Those are really the main issues that we got a lot of questions about around this industry. So you mentioned the litany of resources that CGA has available. Can you discuss some of the most important resources that you offer on this topic and how GATA members can use them to educate their customers? So over the past couple of years, CGA has taken a new stance on where the line is for our standards and safety information. Previously, we had a position that we wrote safety standards with the industry for the industry. And a couple of years ago, our board of directors expanded our, our scope and our mission to include providing basic safety information for end use consideration. So that meant for us producing 
versions of our materials that could be consumed by someone who's new to using our products, like many of these cannabis facility operators are, and that they could really digest and understand. And so one of the things that we've been ramping up our production of are end user safety posters. And in late 2021, we actually produced a series of four posters just for the cannabis industry. And those address safe use and handling of cryogenic liquids, um, understanding carbon dioxide hazards, safe use of compressed gas cylinders and containers, and understanding flammable gas hazards. These posters are downloadable free from CGA's public website. We wanted to make them as accessible as possible with no barriers to entry. You know, we didn't want somebody to feel like they needed to create an account or anything like that that might deter them from downloading the material. And they're really designed to be simple and easy to understand for someone who's never really experienced this product before. They all have a QR code that contains more information about the product being viewed. And importantly for our distributors, they have a spot at the bottom of the poster where a company can brand the poster with their information and include their own contact information. So these are a really good opportunity for GATA distributors and CGA members to be able to share safety information with your customers to, to kind of add some value to that transaction, make sure they've got something that they can physically post in their facilities so that employees who are turning over on a regular basis or anything like that always have this visual reminder of safety. And it's just some, something that's simple and easy um, and, and accessible to share. The other thing that we have that we've produced over the last couple of years are e-learning modules. And these are priced very low so that they're easy for anyone to access. For GATA distributor members who are participating in the CGA subscription program, they're part of that program for you, so they're free. And there are several of those e-learning modules that are applicable to the cannabis industry as well. We really encourage GATA distributor members to share these resources with your customers so that they can continue to interact with these products and equipment safely in their, their operations. With this being a newer industry for a lot of members, are there any common mistakes or safety hazards you've seen come up? You know, as we start to talk with members who are engaging with facilities in this space, we hear a little bit of concern about people understanding the products, people really knowing what they're handling and how to use it safely. I mentioned earlier, one of the concerns that our industry has had is about the potential of the internal contamination of these cylinders. And that's been an area where there's been a great opportunity for the companies serving these customers to connect with those customers and help them understand the potential dangers of backfilling product into these cylinders. So that's one area where we hear a lot from our members, a lot of, a lot of concern, and there's been some really great discussions around that. The other things that are popping up for us are more things around uh, different equipment configurations and particularly that um, there have been some customer modifications of equipment and systems once it's been installed. Um, you know, a, an extra cylinder that's been manifolded on to, to a cylinder bank, uh, sometimes using improper equipment for, for doing that. Um, and so it really does just highlight the importance of the need to stay connected with these customers to help them as they continue to grow, because a lot of these facilities are just rapidly expanding and adding more capacity all the time. Um, and, and making sure that safety is part of that thought process and part of that decision for them as they continue to evolve and expand their facilities. Your website says that due to this industry's rapid expansion, regulation and comprehensive standard programs have not yet fully caught up. How has CGA been able to put together the standards that it has to date? CGA has been in a really fortunate position on this issue where we are able to communicate just the hazards of the gases and the proper techniques for handling and using the equipment. We are not focused on providing information on how to use a certain gas, you know, how to use carbon dioxide in your extraction process. 
we are focused on communicating what are the, the hazards and risks associated with carbon dioxide that someone needs to be aware of. So that's the information that we've had, you know, for over a century now that we're able to, to communicate and share out. And that's how we've been able to, to keep pace with this industry and to, to provide timely and relevant information for them to use. Um, I know there are a lot of other standards groups in this space that are, are having to address more nuanced parts of the processes uh, that go on at cannabis facilities. And that is an important thing for uh, distributors serving these, these organizations to be aware of, is that the, the, particularly the state level codes in this area are rapidly evolving around safety distances and how the different spaces can be configured. Um, how, how temporary walls can be placed uh, around the facility. And so a lot of that is new uh, and there, there's just a lot changing in that area. So it's something to, to stay focused on and to keep present as part of your conversation with your customers. But for CGA's perspective, we're really lucky to just be able to provide those performance-based standards that truly just address kind of the, the end pieces that people need to be worried about rather than writing a prescriptive document on how to use gases in these processes and facilities. Is there anything else on this topic that you want to leave viewers with today? I think the whole conversation around cannabis and really around any emerging market where our industry's products are being adopted and used by people who may not be familiar with them, may not truly understand the hazards, is the opportunity for an important conversation around industry stewardship. We as the industry have a duty to make sure that people using our products can do so safely. And so with this industry in particular, that may look like re-examining your customer qualification and onboarding processes, making sure that your customers are given safety information at the time you start delivering products to their site, encouraging your drivers to report something concerning that they see either to you or to the facility contact that they have. And that's just... I, I think overall for the industry, it's an important aspect of what we do uh, to help make sure that everyone in touch with these products goes home safely at the end of the day. And we have found that the cannabis industry has been really receptive to feedback around safety. They are still very much in the process of seeking federal legalization, and they understand that a large incident is going to seriously set back their efforts to, to achieve that. And so they really want to operate safely. So I encourage you, if you're involved in this space or thinking about getting involved, to have a conversation with your customers about safety and how you can be a, a partnership in ensuring that the gas products used at their facilities have a safety component when anyone is working with them. Laura, we appreciate your time and your insight. Thank you so much for being with us today. We at Nikiso are the leaders in cryogenic pump solutions, starting with our state-of-the-art manufacturing facility here in California. Nikiso ACD is an OEM cryogenic pump manufacturer that's been designing and building cryogenic pumps for nearly 75 years. When it comes to service, nobody does it better. We have six strategically located service centers in North America ready to help you with aftermarket solutions. Call us for cryogenic pump service, parts, or just general advice. We'll help keep your plant running for generations to come. When service matters, we've got you covered. Finally, we're lucky enough to be joined today by Monica Farr. She is the Executive Director of the American Welding Society Foundation. Monica, thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Monica, the AWS is a supporter of Operation Next. For viewers who aren't aware, can you fill us in on what Operation Next is and how the AWS has been involved with it? So Operation Next is actually funded by the Department of Defense. It's a grant funded initiative focused on supporting uh, transitioning military. So that would be um, active, active service members who are within six months of separation from the military to um, provide opportunities for them to seek training and prepare them for a civilian career. The Operation Next program consists of several pathways or training uh, opportunities for the servicemen and women. 
And uh, the areas are in advanced manufacturing. So industrial maintenance, CNC, machining, robotics, and welding. And so the American Welding Society uh, has partnered with uh, the others on this Department of Defense initiative. And we are serving as the resource for the welding program. So we've designed a training the, which uh, the service man or woman takes a portion of the training online. So they access it from the base. It's a, it's a virtual online learning. And then they spend time uh, traveling to a nearby community or technical college where they receive the hands-on training. At the conclusion of the program, the uh, individual has the opportunity to test for and receive a certified welder credential so that they truly, as they leave the military, transition to their civilian career, they have the training and they have an industry recognized credential that American Welding Society certified welder that they can take with them as they seek employment. We've talked about the ongoing labor shortage throughout the industry. Do you feel that veterans are an untapped resource for employers? Why do you feel that military members make such great employees? In some ways, I think that the veterans and military members are a, an untapped market. I think that there are many employers out there that recognize the, um, the value and that recognize that military uh, members and veterans are kind of prime candidates for roles in our industry. And when I say our industry, I'm thinking about manufacturing as a whole. Um, you know, they, they have experiences while they are enlisted. They have opportunities to learn some, some skills that transfer very well into the manufacturing industry and into welding. In fact, many of them have an opportunity to weld while they're in the industry or while they're in the military. They also, of course, have these kind of intangible uh, skills as well, where they, you know, they're very attentive. They are very uh, reliable. They understand the need to, you know, to be at work uh, every day on time. They're responsible. Uh, some of those kind of intangibles that we as employers all recognize are really important. Military members and, and veterans, you know, they, they have those, those intangible skills. And when you, you uh, complement that with some experiences while in the mil military that are manufacturing-like and that uh, maybe are actually directly transferable, like they did act weld while they were in the military, they're a perfect candidate for a, a new hire in our industry. A lot of what the AWS does is in service of addressing the labor shortage, including the careersinwelding.com website. Can you share with us what the message is for potential applicants and employers through the AWS career site? We do have our careersandwelding.com website and, and we created it because we recognize that there's a lot of um, miscommunication. There's some, um, some myths and some untruths about our industry. And we wanted to develop a site that's a go, you know, a go-to resource for valid up-to-date information about the many opportunities that are available in our industry. Dispel some of those myths that welding is dark and dirty and certainly not a career that I would want my child to consider uh, pursuing. And so uh, on the Careers in Welding website, we, we uh, highlight 15 different careers that are prevalent in our industry. And they range from welder to technician to inspector to a supervisor to engineer and research scientist to show that there's a broad range of opportunities for a career in this industry and that you may start somewhere and aspire to grow and to do something else and that those pathways are available. So the 15 different careers, we, we, tend, we try to highlight real people who are in those, those careers and what kind of education they got, uh, what kind of training they may have received, what kind of salary they can expect in that career, where the jobs are, what types of companies and employers are hiring to really kind of showcase the broad, like I said, the broad, not only range of careers that are available, but the many different industries and types of companies that you can work for that are engaged in some type of welding.
So that's just an, an overview of really what our goal for the site is. You mentioned pervasive myths, terms like dark, dirty, and dangerous, which in addition to being false, also probably limit the pool of candidates. In addition to your work at the military, the AWS also has other inclusive programs like women and welding. Can you talk about these initiatives? So we know, looking at data, that the, uh, the welding workforce is rel relatively homogenous. You know, it's largely white males. And, and so in order to grow the number of individuals who are pursuing welding, in order to help employers find talent, we recognize that, that we need to look at non-traditional individuals and try to get them interested and to consider pursuing a career in welding. And that does include females and that includes other underrepresented groups as well. And so um, we are focusing efforts that will attract these different individuals, so different you know, underrepresented groups. And for example, um, with women in welding, we're really putting a focus around growing a network of women, um, celebrating the women, some of the women who are in the industry already, highlighting why they got into it, what they find to be, you know, why they, they stay with it, how rewarding their career is, um, maybe some challenges they've overcome and strategies that other women can, can utilize to, um, to be successful in the industry. And so with women in welding, we recognize that that's, that's a response that, and, and the kind of effort that we need to put forth to, su to support women. But with other underrepresented groups, there's different strategies that are going to be most impactful. That building this network um, may not be the way to, to really foster some of the other underrepresented groups. And so we're looking at different strategies that we're going to be unveiling and, and rolling out here over the course of this next year to really kind of grow the, um, the diversity of individuals who are coming into our industry to, to quite frankly, help companies um, find the skilled labor that they need and stem the shortage. Monica, is there anything else on this topic that you wanted to discuss before we go today? Well, I think I'd like to kind of leave the audience um, with a thought on how they can help, right? And so sharing your story you know, sharing what you love about the industry that you're a part of with young people, pointing uh, young people or others to the resources like careersinwelding.com that we have, because on that website, we do talk about some of these other initiatives focused on veterans and military and focused on women and other underrepresented groups. So challenging people to, to go seek out information on the Careers and Welding website, but just celebrating the industry that you're a part of, sharing your story, and um, encouraging people, young people, whoever, to, to really consider a career in, in, the, in this field that's meant so much to you. That's how you can help help us and, and, and ensure that the future of our, of our industry is bright. Monica, we appreciate you being with us today. Have a great day. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I look forward to being engaged with GATA and uh, together making a difference and, like I said, building a bright future for our industry. Today's member news segment is brought to you by Anthony Welded Products, four generations strong since 1958. Safety Cart announced its 2022 Jimmy Walker Senior Scholarship Award winner. Congratulations to William Harpole from East Mississippi Community College for winning this year's award. The IWDC announced two staff updates. Kathy Ahn was hired to join IWDC's CSR team. She joins IWDC with nearly 35 years of industry experience. The IWDC also announced that Laura Robertson has become its PIM Content Administrator. Laura previously worked in IWDC's Distribution Center Customer Service Department. Air Products was named to Barron's 100 Most Sustainable Companies list for the fourth consecutive year. Air Products ranked 38th on this year's list. 
Red Ball Oxygen welcomed Eric Clay and Carrie Spencer to the company. Eric will join Red Ball's Springdale, Arkansas team as an inside sales rep, while Carrie will be a branch sales rep for the Oklahoma City location. Messer announced a $50 million investment to build a large-scale air separation unit in McGregor, Texas. The new ASU will operate substantially off of energy supplied from an on-site solar panel array. Kaplan Industries announced that it has continued to make progress on its hydrocarbon packaging facility. With 2021 being a banner year for sales of hydrocarbon gases for application in the cannabis extraction market, that growth necessitated the installation of another bulk tank to meet the demand. The CGA issued a press release announcing that helium supply shortage could threaten U.S. semiconductors and medical imaging. For more information about this very important topic, click the link in the description below. Finally, Gauto would like to welcome the following companies as new members of the association. ASCO Carbon Dioxide, Cold Jet LLC, SEPL Industries, and Global Welding LLC. We look forward to seeing you at future Gauta events. To read more about any of these member news items, or to submit member news of your own, read the full March 15th Gauta Connection in your email inbox today, or by clicking the link in the description below. Hobart Institute of Welding Technology offers an AWS certified welding supervisor prep for exam course. This course teaches distributors how to bring real value to their customers by assisting them to reduce weld metal volume, reduce rejects, rework, scrap, and much more. Check our website to see all courses or contact us today at 937-332-9500 for more information on enrollment requirements. We can't wait to see everyone in a couple of weeks in Indianapolis. For last minute information or to register, be sure to visit the Gauta SMC website by clicking the link in the description below. We've got one more episode before we gather together again, and it's a very exciting one. We discuss the hot button issue of mergers and acquisitions. Until then, for all of us here at Gauta TV, this is Steve Guillermo signing off.